Hi everyone. Uh, today's video, I just wanted to address topics of flat earth theory and um, basically what the Bible says about this and what I've sort of investigated in terms of, of this topic, which I haven't really wanted to address because sim I simply didn't know. So in Genesis 1, we look at how God created the heavens and the earth and it says in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and God said let there be light and there was light and God saw the light that it was good and God divided the light from the darkness and God called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. So this is where we get in the flat earth version of our reality that there's waters above and waters below. So we know that we have oceans, so the waters below and then we have a firmament and there's waters above. When we look at the word firmament, and if we go to the Strong's Concordance, it's Rakia 7549, and it means an extended surface or an expanse. Strong's exhaustive from Raka, probably an expanse, the firmament, or apparently visible arc of the sky firmament. Rokar, stamp, beat out or spread out. It says here in Genesis 1.20, Then God said, Let waters teem with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. So that's Genesis 1.20. Let's go to the King James. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creatures that have life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So the firmament is our atmosphere and it's considered one of the heavens. So I just want to explain how I got to the idea of making this video and I've been doing a series of Bible studies with David from Dave the Inhuman channel and we were talking about the firmament and flat earth theories and as I've always maintained I I'm not a person who believes in the flat earth because to be honest I don't know what shape the earth is I think it's an argument that can become a stumbling block to people because it is such a big concept that our earth is a different shape to what we've been brought up to believe but I am a big believer in that what space and science teach us or the space paradigm that we have today is mostly a fairy tale that's been made up by people who are really imaginative and are great at writing scripts. So I started thinking about this a few years back when I was living by the ocean and I was walking one day and looking out to the ocean and there was a, someone had written on a balustrade the earth is flat and I kind of got thinking of why do people believe this and uh, you know I was looking at the water and thinking well you know if the earth is flat then how does it all work and I was thinking why is the sky blue and I'd heard once before that water was blue because of the hydrogen in the water reflects a blue color so the next day I was thinking about it and I prayed to God and said well God why is the sky blue and so obviously the idea came to me that if water is blue because of hydrogen 
then the sky is blue because of hydrogen and it's because the upper atmosphere is gas. I discussed this in one of the talks with Dave, which got me looking deeper into this subject. So in that talk, we talk about gases and I started to look into the idea that the lighter gases rise higher in the atmosphere, just the same way that a helium balloon will rise up to a certain level where it's equal with the weight of the atmosphere. And when I got my answer back from, I believe, God that the upper atmosphere is gases, that I started to look into spectrums of gases and how gases can reflect or shine different colors just the same way that a neon light does. And then I realized that when how a neon light works is that it has gases sealed into like a glass container and they put electrical frequencies or, or electrical waves and currents through the gas which causes it to glow a certain color. And we have a similar effect with our atmosphere or our firmament because it's like a greenhouse. So we're told it's a greenhouse effect. So when the sun comes up and the the light shines through the gases in the upper atmosphere and at different times and different angles of the sun we have more um, shorter wave patterns and then there's longer wave patterns at the end of the night which changes the color reflection. This was a theory of mine like I looked it up it seemed to work in my mind that that's how it could potentially work and so you know, I looked at it in a different way. But just recently, I just, because I've started to talk about this, I started to think, well, if we're putting it out there, you know, a lot of people are going to think this is kind of crazy, but what are people going to make of this? And, and just some random theory. But I started to look into it and realize that this isn't actually a random theory. And that actually, there's a name for this particular theory. So the name of this theory is called Rayleigh scattering and this is really interesting uh, little rabbit hole that I, I went down here. It says uh, Rayleigh scattering dispersion of electromagnetic radiation by particles that have a radius less than approximately one-tenth the wavelength of the radiation. The process has been named in honor of Lord Rayleigh who in 1871 published a paper describing this phenomenon. The angles through which sunlight in the atmosphere is scattered by molecules of the constituent gases varies inversely as the fourth power of the wavelength, hence blue light, which is at the short wavelength end of the visible spectrum, which will be scattered much more strongly than will the long wavelength red light. So, you know, maybe we've got long wavelength and we get red pink sunsets and in the daytime the shorter wavelength is blue light. This results in the blue color of the sunlit sky since in directions other than towards the sun. The observer sees only scattered light. The Rayleigh laws also predict the variation of the intensity of scattered light with direction. One of the results being that there is complete symmetry in the pattern of forward scattering and the backward scattering from single particles. They additionally predict the polarization of the scattered light. But I'm going to get back to this Rayleigh scattering and this guy Lord Rayleigh in particular. So when I was questioning and asking God why was the sky blue, I also looked into how the water can be above and the water below. And I was looking into gases, obviously, as I just said, and I was thinking about the blue of the water and that hydrogen can be a gas and it's also a liquid when it's combined with oxygen to make our water our ocean, so the water below. And perhaps 
that somehow when we get to outer space, if there was water above as well, that perhaps it was some form of gas or, again, the, the gases of the upper atmosphere turn into liquid again. And so I was looking into different types of gases. Um, so we could, because we know that hydrogen is in the upper atmosphere, uh, but also helium is in the upper atmosphere. And I found a substance that is a fluid form of helium. And this particular substance is uh, it's called superfluid. There were more surprises ahead. In the 1930s, another strange phenomenon was observed at even lower temperatures. This rapidly evaporating liquid helium cools until at two degrees above absolute zero, a dramatic transformation takes place. Suddenly, you see that the bubbling stops and that the surface of the liquid helium is completely still. The temperature is actually being lowered even further now, but nothing particularly is happening. Well, this, this is really one of the great phenomena in, in 20th century physics. The liquid helium had turned into a superfluid, which displays some really odd properties. Here I have a beaker with an unglazed ceramic bottom of ultra-fine porosity. Ordinarily, this container with tiny pores can hold liquid helium. But the moment the helium turns superfluid, it leaks through. We call this kind of flow a superflow. Superfluid helium can do things we might have believed impossible. It appears to defy gravity. A thin film can climb walls and escape its container. This is because a superfluid has zero viscosity. It can even produce a frictionless fountain, one that never stops flowing. Superfluidity and superconductivity were baffling concepts for scientists. New radical theories were needed to explain them. I'll just go to the Wikipedia explanation here. It says superfluidity is the characteristic property of a fluid with zero viscosity, which therefore flows without any loss of kinetic energy. When stirred, a superfluid forms vortices that continue to rotate indefinitely. Superfluidity occurs in two isotopes of helium, helium-3 and helium-4, when they are liquefied by cooling to cryogenic temperatures. It is also a property of various other exotic states of matter theorized to exist in astrophysics. Superfluidity often occurs with Bose-Einstein condensation, but neither phenomenon is directly related to the other. So the Bose-Einstein condensate is a state of matter that is typically formed when a gas of bosons at a very low den at very low densities is cooled to temperatures very close to absolute zero. Now this absolute zero is kind of interesting to me if we actually do believe the official version of how cold space is because absolute zero of frozen helium is uh, two, minus 273.15 degrees Celsius or minus 459.67 degrees Fahrenheit. Under such conditions, a large fraction of bosons occupy the lowest quantum state at which microscopic quantum mechanical phenomenon, particularly wave function interference, becomes apparent macroscopically. More generally, condensation refers to the appearance of macroscopic occupation of one or several states, for example, BCS theory. Now, what this actually means is that when helium is, is cooled to those temperatures, it starts to uh, defy gravity and it, it kind of climbs the wall of its container and will come out. But this temperature, for example, is really fascinating to me because when we look or Google the temperature of space, according to 
the official science version, so what is the temperature of space? It, it says here the temperature of space is approximately 2.7 Kelvin or 270.45 degrees Celsius or 454.81 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's practically in the same range of temperature as the superfluid or the Bose-Einstein condensate. So we get helium down to this temperature and it becomes a fluid. So if this is accurate and we can believe these, we can believe the temperature of absolute zero, but can we believe the temperature of space? I'm not sure because there's not a lot about space that I believe. You know, if, if we have a gas, in particular helium in outer space, then at these temperatures, it would definitely be a fluid and it would be, um, I guess you could consider it the waters above, the waters below. You know, if we look at the waters below, they're just a gas too. We've got he hydrogen and oxygen. So H2O becomes our oceans. Are you aware that every NASA rocket launch in history follows an arcing trajectory, curving back down toward the vast expanse of the ocean, rather than actually ascending into space? To date, no space agency has ever presented video evidence of a rocket ascending in a continued vertical trajectory beyond low Earth orbit and into deep space. This absence of footage is attributed to our new understanding that a direct upward course would expose the boundary of our contained world upon contact. This continued practice should now begin to reveal that NASA and other space agencies only create the appearance of rockets heading into space. In reality, their trajectories always curve downward soon after launch, eventually returning to Earth, consistently over the open ocean as observed in every rocket launch in history. The only exception to this were the rockets involved in Operation Fishbowl mentioned earlier, which were part of an effort to investigate the limits of the Earth's upper bounds through a series of detonations impacting against it. This consistent practice prevents extended observation of the rocket's true trajectory, leaving unresolved whether the rocket is actually heading into outer space or merely arcing toward a predetermined splashdown in the ocean, thereby perpetuating a deceptive portrayal of an authentic space launch. This notable omission is difficult to rationalize, especially considering that since 1969, not a single space agency has documented such an event. Video recordings of launches always terminate shortly after liftoff, just as the rocket begins its predictable downward trajectory toward the ocean. We might begin to realize that the only thing ever sent to space has been our imagination. Throughout the history of space exploration, the release of an uninterrupted video capturing a rocket's complete ascent into space could have decisively demonstrated that no physical barrier hinders access to space. Such evidence would have dispelled any notion that rockets are merely returning to restricted ocean areas as part of a deceptive act. This oversight is as hard to believe as an architect designing a skyscraper without including elevators, a fundamental element inexplicably absent from the records of space exploration and rocket launch history. The behavior of amateur rockets as they ascend to higher altitudes is both remarkable and significant to our discussion, particularly as they demonstrate clear interactions with this upper boundary in question. Unlike rockets launched by NASA and other space agencies, which always follow a deliberate arcing trajectory back toward the Earth, amateur rockets ascend directly upward. In 2014, Go Fast Sports launched a rocket that broke world records for altitude and speed. Intriguingly, the rocket abruptly halted at 73.1 miles in altitude, as if caught in quicksand, without any explosion or visible damage. This sudden stop clearly revealed an interaction with an unseen boundary. Surprisingly, the rocket was neither destroyed nor visibly damaged, and successfully reached an orbital phase. In 2017, SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket grazed along a mysterious upper layer, creating an effect similar to gliding on a liquid surface, complete with visible ripples and waves. 
The following images document the event, displaying a trail that resembles rippling water streaming behind the rocket. This visual phenomenon manifests upon contact with the mysterious boundary, showing no prior signs of this effect before impact. NASA astronaut Don Pettit in 2016 stated, I'd go to the moon in a nanosecond. The problem is, we don't have the technology to do that anymore. We used to, but we destroyed that technology, and it's a painful process to build it back again. How can we reasonably accept that more than 50 years after the last moon landings in 1972, the technology from a far less advanced era is now beyond recovery? So here I found an article from Devin Gates. Is the fabric of space-time actually a fluid? And here it says, if you've studied fluid dynamics at all, you'll know that there is still a lot to be discovered, especially as it applies to turbulent flow. But what happens when a fluid is super cold, as cold as outer space? We already know what happens to a fluid that is super cold. Right, I mean outer space is only a few degrees above absolute zero, so any fluid out there would freeze almost instantly right. However, there are certain fluids which will not freeze into a solid. Even in the cold depths of our universe, more specifically liquid helium, is one of those fluids that will not freeze at those extremely low temperatures. Rather, it becomes what we now call a superfluid. And, you know, here's a picture of how the fluid climbs the walls of its container and then will we'll, uh, drip out. Water isn't the only liquid which can freeze. And liquids mostly freeze for the same chemical reason. Liquid helium, on the other hand, is not like most other liquids. When it freezes, something absolutely incredible happens. The molecules do indeed slow down and vibrate together. However, rather than forming a solid and acting as one cohesive object, helium remains a liquid while acting as one cohesive object. So that's kind of interesting. So it can be a liquid, but like one big object, like a block of ice. On the atomic level, the molecules will vibrate at such an energy level that all of the waveforms become one. They all move and flow as if they were all one big molecule of water. The superfluid can still flow just like water, but it can flow much better than water. Because the molecules act as one, there is no friction between them, which means its viscosity is literally zero, since there is absolutely no resistance to flow. In fact, the superfluid can flow through any hole or crack in an object, regardless of how small it may be. However, there is another incredible phenomenon which occurs thanks to vibrating molecules in fluid. Sonoluminescence, light from water. You've heard of bioluminescence and hopefully caught a firefly or two as a kid. In fact, if you've ever seen a scorpion under black light, they actually appear bright green as if they were glowing in the dark. The point is there are more light sources in the world aside from stars, light bulbs and fire. So how could this possibly work? The real answer is obvious. Under very specific conditions in an experimental setting, all you need is a beaker of water, an eyedropper and a very accurate ultrasonic frequency generator that what you get at the end is what some call star in a jar. You use the eye dropper to drop some water into the flask which will form an air bubble. Typically the air bubble will float back to the top and pop or stay submerged for a moment and pop for other reasons. In this experiment we have a very specific frequency of sound being played at a reasonable volume. The frequency will depend on the resonant frequency of the glass beaker so the specific one to use will vary. The point is the glass beaker and the water itself are vibrating at a specific frequency. Under those conditions something rather amazing happens to the air bubble in the water. Rather than floating to the top and popping it remains submerged in water. As if that were not strange enough the bubble can also expand and contract as you adjust the frequency. As the bubble contracts, it actually starts to glow extremely brightly for the relative size of the bubble and the ambient lighting in the room and can produce temperatures far beyond your wildest imagination, upwards of 20,000 Fahrenheit. Wow. Now those extreme temperatures obviously only exist for a split second, but as long as the frequency isn't too high, the air bubble will continue to produce light. 
As you can see in the really cool video, it looks like a star has been plucked right out of the sky and popped into a jar of water. So let's go back to Genesis here and it says, you know, and God said, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light and there was light. Didn't God create the earth with a word? God said, God spoke the, the uh, universe into existence with a vibration, a word, a frequency. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. What does any of this have to do with space? At first I thought it was a coincidence that the vibrating air bubble looked just like a star in space. In fact, it wasn't even being impacted by gravity. The bubble just stays in place and glows as if it actually were a star floating in space. Then I remembered that there is no such thing as coincidence. I thought about it for a minute and the idea came to me, what if space itself is fluid? Not just any fluid, but a superfluid of some kind. So the question of gravity, that pesky gravity, was still going to get in the way. Although the air bubble in the experiment seemed unaffected by gravity, it's still just a tiny air bubble in water. The classic way we visualize gravity is a curvature of the fabric of space-time. That is a great way to visualize gravity if the fabric of space-time were indeed a fabric. But what if space-time were a fluid? Curvature of fluid doesn't make any type of sense, does it? Rather than curvature of the fabric of space-time, what if we were all ab about the flow and the fluid of space-time? If space were a fluid, super fluid, then it would make intuitive sense that a flowing current would make great analogy for gravity. But what exactly does that mean? What would cause the fluid of space-time to flow? So since a superfluid is frictionless and acts as a single cohesive molecule, it can actually flow through any size hole or crack large enough for a single helium atom. That is what made me connect the dots. If space were a superfluid and the superfluid could flow through almost any hole, then it would make perfect sense to think of gravity as the flow of space-time as it flows through matter on the atomic level itself. So on a microscopic level, practically any object is porous, even a bar of steel is porous. So assuming all matter is somewhat porous, it makes sense that if space were superfluid, it would flow through any piece of matter. It's a process called sonoluminescence. The first time I saw sonoluminescence was in a darkened room. I was transfixed to look at this uh, spherical flask of fluid. And you look into the center, and in the center see a, uh, a glowing blue-purple light, uh, which could be seen with the unaided eye. It looked like a star in the heavens. Seth Putterman called it the star in a jar, a tiny spot of bright light contained in a flask of liquid. This star in a jar is made when a sound wave is passed through a small bubble inside a flask of liquid. And this sound wave makes the bubble do something remarkable. First it expands, then it collapses. And this collapse happens so violently that vapor molecules trapped inside the bubble slam together and heat up so much that the bubble gives off an incredible burst of heat and light several thousand times a second, giving the appearance of a star. What made the phenomenon so exciting was the temperature of this star in a jar. On its surface alone, the light burns at tens of thousands of degrees. And 
Seth Butterman now contemplated a tantalizing possibility. Could the core of the collapsing bubble be even hotter? Hot enough for fusion? One of the mysteries of sonar luminescence is to determine exactly how hot the interior of the bubble gets. In the sun, the interior can be millions of degrees, hot enough to uh, cause fusion. And the thought crossed my mind that perhaps inside the collapsing bubble, the interior of the bubble might also get hot enough to cause fusion. If so, this would be something truly amazing. By simply bombarding tiny bubbles with sound waves, temperatures of over 10 million degrees would be created. A nuclear fusion, the same reaction that powers the sun, would be happening almost effortlessly here on Earth. If space-time is like a liquid, a concept some physicists say could help resolve a confounding disagreement between two dominant theories in physics, it must be a very special liquid indeed. A recent study compared astrophysical observations with predictions based on the notion of fluid space-time and found the idea only works if space-time is incredibly smooth and freely flowing. In other words, a superfluid. Thinking of space-time as a liquid may be a helpful analogy. We often picture space-time as fundamental backdrops to the universe, but what if they are not fundamental and built instead of smaller ingredients that exist on a deeper layer of reality that we cannot see? If that were the case, space-time's properties would emerge from the underlying physics of its constituents, just as water properties emerge from the particles that comprise it. Water is made of discrete individual molecules which interact with each other according to the laws of quantum mechanics, but liquid water appears continuous and flowing and transparent and refractive, explains Ted Jacobson, a physicist at the University of Maryland College Park. These are all emergent properties that cannot be found in the individual molecules, even though they ultimately derive from the properties of those molecules. Physicists have been considering this possibility since 1990s in an attempt to reconcile the dominant theory of gravity on a large scale, general relativity. With the theory governing the very smallest bits of the universe, quantum mechanics, both theories appear to work perfectly within their respective domains, but conflict with one another in situations that combine the large and small, such as black holes, extremely large masses, extremely small volume. Many physicists have tried to solve the problem by quantizing gravity, dividing it into small bits, just as quantum mechanics breaks down many quantities, such as particles' energy levels into discrete packets. There are many attempts to quantize gravity, string theory and loop quantum gravity, are alternative approaches that can both claim to have gone a good leg forward, says Stefano Liberati, a physicist at the International School for Advanced Studies in Trizzi, Italy. But maybe you don't need to quantize gravity, you need to quantize this fundamental object that makes space time. Liberati, along with colleague Luca Marcioni of Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, recently explored how that idea would affect light traveling through the universe. An emergent space-time, one that acted like a fluid, would not be immediately distinguishable from the space-time of any other theory. But in extreme situations, such as for every energetic light, particles Liberati and Marcioni found that some differences would be noticeable. In fact, by examining observations of high-energy photons flying across the universe from the Crab Nebula, the physicists were able to rule out certain versions of emergent space-time, finding that if it is a fluid at all, it must be a superfluid. The researchers published their results in April 14 physical review letters. So in this analogy, particles would travel through space-time like waves in an ocean, and the laws of fluid mechanics, condensed matter physics, would apply. Previous 
physicists considered how particles of different energies would disperse in space-time, just as waves of different wavelengths disperse or travel at different speeds in water. So now I'm going to go to Thales of Miletus, and he was one of the original uh, philosophers. Thales was a pre-Socratic philosopher. He's regarded as the father of Greek philosophy and the first Greek scientist a mathematician, although he was an engineer by training. He believed that natural phenomena could be explained by laws rather than resorting to supernatural explanations. Thales pictured the earth as a flat disk that floated on an infinite ocean. Interesting. Perhaps motivated by observations that would, perhaps motivated, this is just their conclusion, that wood and other substances floated on water. Water was important to him. He as he saw it as the fundamental material from which everything else in the universe developed. Compare his view with um, Anaximenes and Heraclitus, who considered air and fire respectively to be the source of all other material. Now, you know, a lot of scientists today would think, oh, well, he was ignorant to what we know today. But was he? Because... You know, we know that the ancient Greeks come from the ancient Israelites, uh, as it was the Greeks that the apostles went to uh, to reunite the houses of Israel. And perhaps Thales knew of the book of Genesis, because all we have to do is go back to the book of Genesis and. Here we have in the beginning, it's telling us that God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form of void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. So God's telling us that everything was created from water, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and he created it with his voice. He spoke it into existence. So it's a vibration or a frequency, a sound. The Greek historian Herodotus attributes the prediction of a solar eclipse on the 28th of May 585 BC during a battle between the Medes and the Lydians of Thal to Thales. Thales may have been familiar with the Saros cycle of the Babylonian astronomers, but this would not provide him with sufficient information to make a true prediction. So he, this guy knew what he was on about, like predicting eclipses and... Um, you know, the timing and accuracy of, of the planets. Although we can now make accurate predictions about when and where total eclipses will be seen, there is still a great deal of uncertainty as to how Thales would have done it. None of Thales' writings have survived, although it is not known whether he wrote that much. His philosophical and scientific ideas were documented by Aristotle in Metaphysics, Thales founded the Milesian School of Philosophy, of which Anaximander and Anaximenes were members. So Thales determines that water is the source of everything. So as the story goes, Thales of Miletus, an astronomer among many other things, was walking along gazing at stars, not watching where he was going, when he fell into a well. A story like that is stereotypical of a philosopher who has his mind so set on lofty ideas he loses touch with earthly things. With Thales, nothing could be further from the truth. In addition to being an astronomer and a philosopher, he was also an engineer, a meteorologist and a mathematician. He was considered one of the seven sages of Greece. In one of his many claims to fame, he is said to have predicted a solar eclipse in 585 BC, something that was very difficult to do. Because of this eclipse, a 15-year battle between the Medians and the Lydians ended in a truce as both sides laid down their arms. So of all of his accomplishments, his greatest claim to fame was that of being the first philosopher. I mentioned how the poet Hesiod broke new ground in cosmology by compiling a comp comprehensive account of the origin of the cosmos, so the Greek term for universe. He attributed the origin of the cosmos to the gods rather than naturalistic causes. Thales took this a step further and started looking for a naturalistic cause for the origin of the universe. As mentioned in post 23, the overall cause or origin of the universe was the Greeks termed arche. Aristotle defines arche as that of which all existing things are composed 
and that from which they originally come to be and that into which they finally perished. The Arche is the primary or originating principle of the universe, even though the concept of Arche originated with Hesiod, who attributed it to the gods, it was Thales and the pre Socratics who sought the Arche in naturalistic causes. When the Greeks talked about origin, they did not mean something arising out of nothing, ex nilo, as the Judeo Christian tradition, for them, matter was eternal and always existed. The question for Thales was, what was the original or primary element of matter from which the other elements arose? In other words, which element was the arche of the cosmos? The contenders for the arche were what the Greeks considered the basic elements of the cosmos. Earth, air, fire and water. They believed that the elements could change into one another. So Thales tried to rationalize which of the elements was the originating principle. Well, this is true because the elements can actually change into the other. So we have hydrogen, which makes water, but hydrogen can also, as a gas, be extremely flammable. And also, these particular gases can cause elements to form, uh, which make up our Earth. There is evidence that Thales travelled to Egypt and possibly other places. He would have learned about the Nile and its annual cycle of flooding and recession. When the Nile flooded, the plant life decayed and decomposed, turning into methane, a flammable gas. Thus, all of the four elements were present. The same phenomenon occurred with the Tigris and the Euphrates River in Mesopotamia, as well as the mouth of the river Meander in Thales' hometown of Miletus. These rivers would leave a layer of fertile soil which would begin the planting cycle all over again. So water is the principal element of the universe. Also he noticed that water was ubiquitous. It fell from the sky, it was in the soil and it was inside of plants. With observations such as these, it is no wonder that Thales concluded that water was the arche or principal element of the cosmos. As such, he believed that water then changed into earth, air and fire. There were two things that made Thales and the other pre-Socratics unique and distinguish them from those who, be, who came before. The first is that they looked for naturalistic explanations of things and the second is that they used rational arguments to come to their conclusions. Seeking knowledge about the cosmos made Thales a philosopher and using rational arguments to come to these conclusions made him a scientist. In the beginning philosophy and science were in essence the same. We have to be careful though in projecting our modern secular mindset onto pre-Socratics. We could easily assume that by seeking naturalistic explanations they denied a divine. Nothing could be further from the truth. Christopher Hollis has a great quote uh, uh, in Noble Castle to this effect. The great Greeks did rightly use their reason to purify themselves of their superstitions, but reason did not lead them to the conclusions that rationalism was the explanation of all. It led rather to the conclusion that rationalism was insufficient. In addition to the arche, the other thing that characterized the cosmos was movement. Movement for the Greeks meant life and being. So even though water was the naturalistic first principle of the universe, according to Thales, the universe could not be alive or have movement unless it had a soul. Thales thought that a magnet was alive and therefore had a soul simply because it caused iron to move. Note the following quote from Aristotle. Thales, to, to judge from what is recorded of his views, seemed to suppose that the soul is in a sense the cause of movement since he says that a stone, magnet or lodestone, has a soul because it causes movement to iron. For Thales, this soul permeated the universe. This prompted Aristotle to say, For Thales, all things are full of gods. Finally, I think the following quote from Aristotle sums up Thales' contribution to philosophy the best. Thales, the introducer of this sort of philosophy, said that it, the arche, was water. That is why he declared the earth to be sitting on water. Perhaps during this 
supposition from seeing that the nourishment of all creatures is moist and that warmth itself arises from this and that it is by this that all creatures live. And the assumption that from which a thing comes is its principle in all cases. For this reason, indeed, taking this assumption and also because the seed of all creatures have a moist nature and water is the natural principle for moist things. So unfortunately, what writings we have of Thales exist only in fragments and quotes from later philosophers. We don't know the full extent of his beliefs. I find it interesting that he may have posited an early form of dualism where the universe had a physical origin but was animated by a divine soul. Later, philosophers such as Thomas Aquinas would further develop these ideas of causation. Aquinas talked about primary and secondary causation. Primary causation is the being of everything which has its origin in the divine and secondary causation involves the creatures who are dependent on the divine. So, you know, like we have Thales saying that everything comes from water, but it's not really a new concept because we have we have the Bible telling us that everything comes from water. Um, the earth was without form or void. So, you know, Thales is saying that uh, all other elements come from water. So the, the earth itself has no form. Um, darkness was upon the face of the deep, so the deep water, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So the Bible tells us in the beginning exactly how we were created or how the earth came to being. And, you know, it's not a big explosion or a big bang. It's That's the opposite of the truth. So as these Greek philosophers were saying that the original matter of creation that is eternal is water and the Bible would seem to agree with that because God was there and there was the deep. When we look into the occult version of creation, which goes back to the ancient Greek philosophers anyway, and the Gnostics, uh, which go back to you know the uh, Zoroastrians and this, uh, the earliest Babylonian mythology. Yeah, it says in the Platonic, Neo-Pythagorean, Middle Platonic and Neoplatonic schools of philosophy, the Demiurge, sometimes spelled as Demiurge, is an artisan-like figure responsible for fashioning and maintaining the physical universe. So the arche dualistic ideology of the Gnostics, you know, so they believed that we have this spiritual element and this physical element. I don't think it's quite Kabbalistic. I mean, that's obvious we have a spiritual and a physical element to the universe. The god Marduk, who was the god of water, create, god of creation, water, agriculture. So Marduk was a Sumerian, the sun, solar calf. His father was Enki. So Enki is the Sumerian god of water and creation and one of, the Anunnaki. So he was originally the patron god of the city of Eridu, but later the influence of the cult spread throughout Mesopotamia and to the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Hurrians. He was associated with the southern band of constellations called the stars e Ea, but also with the constellation Esiku, uh, the field square of Pegasus. So the planet Mercury associated with the Babylonian Nabu, the son of Marduk was in Sumerian times identified with Enki as the star Canopus. So that is uh, that reminds me of Tiamat. So the Babylonian mythology Tiamat is one of the foundational principles of the universe known as maelstrom of dark, roiling seawater. In the cosmogonic myth outlined in the Enuma Eilish, the Babylonian creation epic, she combines with Apsu, the personification of fresh water and their union gives rise to the first generation of gods. So you know, even in this occultish version of creation we have water being the uh, main source of creation. So if we were to think about this in terms of uh, how Thales of Melantus uh, saw our creation, if we 
throughout all of our concepts of space and our earth and environment that we're told today and we just went on these ancient people and on the Bible, you know, we could probably imagine that, uh, you know, the earth the was formed out of water, the elements came out of the some kind of alchemical transformation and that, you know, within that time God created some kind of atmosphere which we have here and God said let there be a firmament. And in the Strong's, as we said, firmament means to the expanse or the, uh, let's have a look, an extended surface or expanse. So, you know, we could perhaps consider that we have water below, which is the ocean. We have the earth floating upon the ocean. I mean, that's part of our theory at the moment is the whole uh Gondwana theory where the, the continents float somehow and move slowly at, at a you know certain rate uh, were originally together as one mass and then broke up uh, and they're floating on I don't know what are they floating on water the plates lava um, as we're told but I don't think you know they really know all that much about it um, and we could imagine that we kind of live in a, a, gl a glass house or a uh, an air bubble, and you know when we look at that article with that we were uh, looking at the stars in jars, and uh, they form inside an air bubble, the light inside an air bubble, um, and that's been replicated in a lab. You know this is something we know can work in a model, and it can work in reality. The firmament or the first heaven where the birds fly and we have water below, we have different levels of gases because oxygen is just a form, it's all just gases, there's uh, heavier gases, lighter gases, uh, they've proven that in the upper atmosphere there are lighter gases uh, which they kind of talk about but you know they don't give a great deal of information about unless it's for a green agenda that's like a greenhouse effect and greenhouse gases that somehow whatever we're doing here on earth is is uh, destroying our ozone layer but realistically I mean if we're releasing gases they would just settle at a certain level of where those gases according to their weight would settle so I don't see how it could potentially destroy anything in our firmament so, but this gets us back to uh, the color of the sky and um, the Rayleigh scattering. So, John William Strutt, third Baron of Rayleigh, he was an English mathematician and physicist who made extensive contributions to science. He spent all of his academic career at the University of Cambridge. Among many honors, he received. In 1904, a Nobel Prize in Physics for his investigations to the densities of the most important gases for his discovery of argon. In connection with these studies, he served as President of the Royal Society from 1905 to 1908 and as Chancellor of the University of Cambridge from 1908 to 1919. Rayleigh provided the first theoretical treatment of the elastic scattering of light by particles much smaller than the light wavelength, a phenomenon known as the Rayleigh scattering, which notably explains why the sky is blue. Okay, so yeah, I came up with this uh, idea while I was having a shower with um, and talking to God, why is the sky blue? And these are the ideas that popped into my head. And here we have a guy in 1908, or sorry, 19 in the early 1900s, explaining why the sky is blue. He studied and described transverse surface waves in solid, now known as Rayleigh waves. He contributed extensively to fluid dynamics. So what are fluid dynamics? In physics, physical chemistry and engineering, fluid dynamics is a sub-discipline of fluid mechanics that describes the flow of fluids, liquids and gases. 
It has several sub-disciplines, including aerodynamics, the study of air and other gases in motion, and hydrodynamics, the study of water and other liquids in motion. Fluid dynamics has a wide range of applications, including calculating forces and movements on aircraft, determining the mass flow rate of petroleum through pipelines, predicting weather patterns, understanding nebula in interstellar space, and modeling fusion weapon detonation. Now, this is really interesting with the understanding nebula in space because, um, you know, nebula are just a cloud of gases and dust. And they are basically a plasma light or a, like a neon light. Um, and, but what's causing the light to come from these nebulas? You know, like is it stars within them or like is it, you know, when we have this star in a jar kind of phenomenon where we've got a, uh, a vibration for, forming a light? Um, is it electricity, electromagnetic waves that are at a pinpoint as, a, you know, the electric universe people speak of, but in the talk, Dave talks about the moon uh, being a plasma light and not a rock. And I kind of think that the moon could potentially be like, this is my own personal belief, that the moon could potentially be like a nebula, like it does appear to have a surface with, with shapes that are unchanging, but so do nebulas. They have dust particles within the, that gas that uh, form shapes, as here we have a horse head, a horse head, an eagle nebula. There's lots of different nebulas with names associated with the, uh, the look they have, and, and, you know, is that unchanging? Fluid dynamics offers a systematic structure which underlies these practical disciplines that embraces empirical and semi-empirical laws derived from flow measurement and used to solve practical problems. So, you know, this guy's all into all of these subjects that we're talking about based on the first chapter of Genesis and how creation actually happened according to the Bible and not according to um, NASA and its current version of, of how the universe works. So with concepts such as the Rayleigh number, a dimensionless number associated with natural convection, Rayleigh flow and Rayleigh-Taylor instability, and Rayleigh's criterion for stability of Taylor Kuwait flow. He also formulated the circulation theory of aerodynamic lift. In optics, Rayleigh proposed a well-known criterion for angular resolution. His derivation of Rayleigh gene laws for classic black body radiation later played an impact role in the birth of quantum mechanics, see ultraviolet catastrophe. Rayleigh's textbook, The Theory of Sound, is still used today by acousticians and engineers. He introduced the Rayleigh test for circular non-uniformity of which the Rayleigh plot visualizes. So this guy is doing experiments into gas, gas light reflection. Um, so Rayleigh discovered argon the gas argon. But what's really interesting about this guy Rayleigh is that his connections are interesting. And, you know, so he's not only like discovering all of these scientific observations about the atmosphere, the upper atmosphere, uh, and how it works, but if we look at his personal life, it says, Rayleigh married Evelyn Georgina Mary Ne Balfour. This Balfour was none other than the sister of Arthur Balfour, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, when they signed the Balfour Declaration to allow the Rothschilds back into Israel. So this guy had some really big connections. And... We've got to start asking the question, 
if what he's saying is true here with the Rayleigh scattering, which seems to fit biblical creation stories and, um, you know, is all about wavelengths, light, gases, sound. So it says here, he began work on his great book, The Theory of Sound, in which he examined questions of vibration and the resonance of elastic solids and gases. You know, they, if they understand that space is not just nothing, like that was always my question, what was space made out of? Like if we went into space and we got a jar of space and we brought it back and we studied what was in it, I've been told it's nothing. They say that space is nothing and that it's a vacuum. Space is a vacuum. There's nothing in space. It's not made up of anything. Like we have our air, which is oxygen. Um, they the space is just nothing. But you know, if he's done studies into the atmosphere and the gases and what our atmosphere is made of, then they would know that potentially the Bible's right about what is in above. Above is water, below is water, in between is the firmament. Rayleigh carried out vigorous research program on the precision determination of electrical standards. He's working with uh, electrical frequencies, current, uh, currents, um, gases, lights. Rayleigh's greatest single contribution to science is generally considered to have been his discovery of and isolation of argon, one of the rare gases of the atmosphere. Precision measurements of the density of gases conducted by him in the 1880s led to the interesting discovery that the density of nitrogen obtained from the atmosphere is greater by a small, though definite amount. Since his first publication was a combination of three short chemistry papers on fictitious airs or gases produced in the laboratory, he produced inflammable air hydrogen by dissolving metal in acids and fixed air, carbon dioxide, by dissolving alkalis in acids and he collected these and other gases in bottles inverted over water or mercury. He then measured their solubility in water and their specific gravity. So he finally succeeded in 19, so 1895 in isolating the gas which was appropriately named argon from the Greek word meaning inactive. So, I mean, we've got these people and they're all connected. So Arthur Balfour, he was a um, elder son of James Maitland Balfour, Lady Blanche Gassioni Cecil. So is that like Cecil of Rhodes? His father was a Scottish MP and as was his grandfather, James. His mother was a member of the Cecil family. So the branch of the Cecil family des descends from Sir Robert Cecil the son of the prominent statesman of the first Baron Burgley. Cecil notably served under Queen Elizabeth I. Says Cecil family, one of England's most famous and politically influential families represented by two branches holding respectively the Marquisates of Exeter and Salisbury, both descending from William Cecil, Lord Burley, and Elizabeth I, Lord Treasurer. Now, Cecil Rhodes as a different surname, I'm just wondering if he's, he's actually uh, related to them, but he's certainly connected to them by the Rothschild family. So we've got the Rothschild Cecil Rhodes and the colonization of Africa. It says the colonization of Africa during the late 19th and early 20th centuries was driven by European powers seeking economic, political and imperial dominance. The Rothschild banking family played a significant role in the process of providing financial support to Cecil John Rhodes and the British South African Company. In this entry, we explore the historical context and collaboration between the Rothschilds and Rhodes and the impact of their financial banking on the colonization of African countries like South Africa and Zimbabwe. Specifically, it delves into the role of Baron Nathan de Rothschild and the resources of the De Beers. Uh, we know that the beers are related to the Oppenheimers and, and uh, going back to the Bauer Rothschild family again. Syndicate and gold fields of South Africa in the establishment or, and activities of BSAC. The British South Africa Company established in 1889 was an amalgamation of the London-based group led by G Lord Gifford and George 
Corsten and Cecil John Rose and his South African associates, including Alfred Beat. The primary objective of the company was to secure British control over mineral-rich regions of South Africa. However, the financial source required for such an endeavour was immense and this was where Rothschild Banking family led by Baron Nathan de Rothschild played a crucial role. The Rothschild Banking family, known for their global financial influence, provided sufficient financial backing to Cecil John Rhodes and the BSAC. Baron Nathan de Rothschild, one of the prominent members of the family, played, a entire, a, played a central role in the collaboration. So yeah, we, we see that Arthur Balfour also had a lot to do with the Rothschild fam family and uh, he's from this very prominent political family, uh, English aristocracy. So here it says Balfour remained important in the party however and when the Unionists joined Asquith's coalition government in May 1915, Balfour succeeded Churchill as the first lord of the Admiralty. Now, Asquith is also, he was actually the grandfather of the actress Helena Bonham Carter. When Asquith's government collapsed in December 1916, Balfour, who seemed a potential successor to the premiership, became Foreign Secretary and Lord Lloyd George's new ad administration, but not in the small war cabinet and was frequently left out of inner workings of government. Balfour's service as Foreign Secretary was notable for the Balfour mission a critical alliance building visit to the US in 1917 and the Balfour Declaration of 1917, the letter to Lord Rothschild affirming the government support, government's support for the establishment of a national home for Jewish people in Palestine, then part of the Ottoman Empire. So yeah, the Balfour Declaration was a public statement issued by the British government in 1917 during the First World War announcing its support for the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine, then an Ottoman region with the small minority Jewish population. The declaration was contained in a letter dated 2nd November 1917 from the United Kingdom Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour to Lord Rothschild, a leader of the British Jewish community for transmission to the Zionist Federation of Great Britain and Ireland. The text of declaration was published in the press on the 9th of November 1917. So, you know, here we have this declaration declaring that the so-called Jewish people should have their, their land back in Palestine. And, you know, I'm not going to go into that any further here but we know that this is a fictional story that these people are not the true Israelites and that there's no religious or genetic claim to this piece of land and and we have this whole worldview now and our politics our wars our life is completely ruled by this fictional story that somehow God has blessed Israel and we all have to bless Israel and our whole lives are revolved around the politics, the war, the banking of these specific people. And, you know, everybody shares this world view. Everybody has this uh, kingdom of the beast in their mind. And this really is a fictional kingdom that this beast has created. So, you know, going back to space and the understanding of how our environment works what's to say that this whole concept isn't fiction either you know we've got the moon missions space missions I mean how far have they actually gone in space we have the um, the moon landing supposedly recreated in a Hollywood sound studio by Stanley Kubrick and it's a very convincing argument obviously we know that they put satellites so at some height in our atmosphere and they have the potential to do that but um, have they ever actually been to space you know we see the Elon Musk videos of SpaceX and they're all being CGI'd every angle of our understanding of our environment goes back to these people and it links back to these aristocratic lines, Robert Strutt, fourth Baron of Rayleigh, uh, he was the son of 
John William Strutt, the third Baron of Rayleigh, the Rayleigh Spectrum. And, you know, he was also a scientist. So his mother was the sister of Lord Balfour, Arthur Balfour. He went to Eton College, Trinity College, Cambridge, all of the uh, well famous schools that all the, the royal families go to. And uh, he was famous for fellow, uh, fellow of Trinity College, Cambridge, as one of as one who made discoveries in physics and as author of the following papers: the least potential difference required to produce discharge through various gases, the dispersion of the cathode rays by magnetic gases, the discharge of electricity through argon and helium, the behaviour of Becquerel and Röntgen rays in magnetic fields, um, the conductivity of gases under Becquerel rays, uh, the tendency of the atomic weight to approximate to whole numbers, um, the discharge of positive electrification by hot metals, uh, Electrical conductivity of metals and their vapours. Some recent investigations on electrical conduction, preparation and properties of an intensely radioactive gas from metallic mercury. Radioactivity of ordinary materials. Absorption of light by mercury and its vapour. The intensely penetrating rays of radium. Fluorescence of crystals under rotogen rays. and Experiment to exhibit the loss of negative electri electricity by radium. So Strutt's best known work in the period of 1904 to 1910 was the estimation of the age of minerals and rocks by measurement of their radium and helium content. So, you know, was he part of the um, whole uh, carbon dating science? In 1908, he appointed Professor of Physics at the Imperial College London where he followed up his father's work on light scattering which is now known as Rayleigh scattering resulting in some papers published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society. He published a biography of his father, the third Baron Rayleigh with the title of Life of John William Strutt, third Baron Rayleigh. In 1916 working with his colleague Alfred Fowler, Strutt was the first to prove the existence of ozone in the atmosphere by examining the ultraviolet spectrum of the setting sun. There we go. Strutt proved that the ozone was mainly located in the upper atmosphere in what is now called the ozone layer. Now, And then we had in the 80s all this ozone layer, end of the world Armageddon scenario. And what we have today is using this kind of science for the green agenda and uh, carbon taxes. Following the death of his father in 1919, Strutt resigned his chair at Imperial College but continued to experiment at home on the private laboratory that his father had established in an old stable block. His earlier work on gaseous discharge and fluorescence led to further work on the luminosity of the night sky. So there we go, like working on um, finding out about uh, auroras. He was the first to differentiate between two types of light from the night sky, the aurora or the northern lights and the air glow that prevents the sky ever being completely dark anywhere on earth. In 1929, he was the first to measure the intensity of light from the night sky. This work led to the posthumous nickname, the air glow Rayleigh. The importance of his unpublished data was such that the US Air Force Cambridge Research Laboratories acquired it in 1963 almost by accident at the same time of many of his father's experimental notebooks. They are now housed in the McDermott Library of the US Air Force Academy, Colorado Springs, Colorado. The Rayleigh unit of photon flux used to measure air glow is named after him. A special issue applied optics published in 1964 is devoted to the third and fourth Baron Rayleigh's. So, yeah, like, I mean, every angle of our concept of reality is given to us by these particular people or manipulated by these particular people. And I'm not saying that these guys' studies were wrong or, but, you know, they have the money, they have the power, they're
from these aristocratic families and they advantage on or on giving us our narrative, on giving us our worldview. Um, and they manipulate it. So going back to Thales of Milet Miletus, you know, he believed that the earth was floating on water, it was a flat disk. We are given these images of a globe that we know are all either CGI or have been altered artistically or it's an artist's impression of, of space. A lot of the pictures from space aren't real. And in all honesty, I can say I don't know. I don't know what we're on, but I'm convinced that the Bible is right and that there are waters above and there are waters below and we have a firmament that we are living in. That is our atmosphere. And if that is a bubble shape like these stars in a jar or um, I think the atmosphere is is probably shaped like a bubble but the shape of the earth I, I don't know what we live on I can't go there I can't see it um, and it doesn't matter it doesn't really matter because we're just alive and we're here and we're living it's not a an issue of salvation but what is is like our worldview we really have to take what we're told and what we're given is information and question is that true is that what God tells us because we know that God will tell us the truth if we ask if we ask for it he's going to tell us exactly how he created it and he does here you know he says that the the universe was created from water and the foundation of the earth came from the water the waters were divided from the waters so there are waters under the firmament and there's waters above the firmament and that the earth was without void in the first day and all of these scientific versions of how that could work ring true with this scripture. The the version that we're given of the Big Bang and that uh, we have dark matter and all these crazy theories and that uh, we've been to the moon, even though it's almost impossible to uh, leave the Van Allen belts and, you know, all of these notions we have to question and our whole beast reality is one big lie. Uh, and I think we really need to not convince other people about this so much because it's kind of almost impossible to convince people. But <clears throat> as Christians get back to the foundation of what we're taught in the Bible and try to build our worldview or our kingdom view around that. This article from Tragedy and Hope, which you can find online, it says, Why does Great Britain identify with Zionists? To answer this question, we must make ourselves familiar with the movement known as the British Israel World Federation, also known as World Federalism or British Israelism. According to Wikipedia, the British Israel World Federation was born as a movement in the 19th century and federated in 1919 during the days when the sun never set on British Empire. From 1924, the organisation maintained an office next to Buckingham Palace. In 1990, it moved to Putney on the Thames, but since 2003 has been based near Bishop Auckland in County Durham. British Israelism, also called Anglo-Israelism, is a doctrine based on the hypothesis that people of Western European descent, particularly those in Great Britain, are the direct lineage descendants of the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel. The doctrine often includes the tenet that the British royal family is directly descended from the line of King David. Now, you know my thoughts on this. I think that they potentially are because through the Herod family line, we have King Herod the Great actually marrying into the um, Judean royal family and taking this claim that they are the direct line from King David, therefore giving them some kind of messianic rights. Zionists such as the Warburg, Schiffs and Kuhn Loeb were instrumental in creation of Federal Reserve Banking System which then spawned the rise, direct financing and protection of Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin and later Hitler. 
This story of the 20th century democide funded by the Rothschilds International Banking Syndicate is distilled in detail within monumental works such as Anthony C. Sutton's Wall Street Trilogy um, and Tragedy and Hope and the Anglo-American Establishment by Quig uh, Carol Quigley as well as The Secrets of Federal Reserve by Eustace Mullins. Well, we'll learn more about this in our com upcoming chapters. Uh, here's an article here from the um, it's a Jewish Chronicle, the royal links that go back to Natty Rothschild. And if I scroll down, it says here in 1883, Edward wrote him a gushing letter. My dear Natty, I cannot find words too extreme in gratitude for your kindness and liberality, which you may be convinced will never be forgotten by me. It was no surprise that Natty was invited to join the Privy Council after the king's coronation in 1902. So this king was King Edward. Rothschild was friendly with the other giant figures of his age, Desraeli, Balfour and Asquith, as well as Theodore Herschel and Cecil Rhodes. He benefited from Britain's imperial expansion and also played a role in this, particularly in Egypt and South Africa. His friendship with Rhodes enabled him to invest heavily in the diamond mines of South Africa, particularly De Beers, and to participate fully in the expansion of the deep gold mines in the Rand. Rhodes had a gigantic vision for the British Empire obtaining mastery over the entire world. He thought that Britain should take over the whole African continent. Rothschild shared his vision to a limited extent and at times intervened to assist British imperial ambitions in southern Africa and Egypt. Until the end of Herzl's life, Natty supported his colonization schemes in Al Arish and East Africa but vetoed any suggestion of Jewish self-government. With the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, Rothschild was prepared to see British control of Palestine, though the Jewish side of the question remained a secondary concern. Yeah, sure it did. And here we've got Rothschild interest in South Africa. The Rothschilds had decided upon the formula of a managed conflict for the First World War because of the difficulty they had encountered in defeating the Boers in South Africa from 1899 to 1901. After illegally annexing the Transvaal in 1881, the British had been turned back with a resounding defeat at Majuba by Paul Kruger. In 1889, because of the discovery of vast wealth and gold diamonds in South Africa, the Rothschilds became, uh, came back to loot the nation with 400,000 British soldiers pitted against 30,000 irregulars, that is farmers with rifles, whom the Boers could put into the field. The Boer War was started by the Rothschilds agent Lord Alfred Milner against the wishes of a majority of the British people. His plans were aided by another Rothschild agent, Cecil Rhodes, who later left his entire fortune to the furtherance of the Rothschild program through the Rhodes Trust. So we all know about Rhodes scholars and politicians being involved in the Rhodes scholarships uh, thereby getting themselves into high positions in politics. Uh, a by no means infrequent denouncement among Rothschild agents and the basis of the entire foundation empire today. Um, so, you know, we, we don't know where Rhodes comes from, but he certainly was well connected with these people even at a young age. This website about the round table, it says how Cecil Rhodes fathered the modern globalist movement. Uh, driven by some of the wealthiest people of all time, a totalitarian one-world government by an elite administered by the corporate-owned United Nations with the help of corporate-owned NGOs appears to be unstoppable. The modern project for global governance by an elite goes back to Cecil Rhodes. Cecil Rhodes uh, was a British businessman, mining magnate and politician in South Southern Africa who served as Prime Minister of the Cape Colony from 1890 to 1896 and oversaw the foundation of Rhodesia. One of Rhodes' primary motives in politics and business was his professed belief that the Anglo-Saxon race was, to quote his will, the first race in the world. In 1877, Cecil Rhodes wrote at the age of 22 in a confession of faith, why should we not form a secret society with but one object, the furtherance of the British Empire and the bringing 
of the whole uncivilized world under British rule for the recovery of the United States for the making the Anglo-Saxon race but one empire. So in his third will, Rhodes leaves everything to Lord Rothschild, referring to the matter discussed between several of Rhodes' wills, the first two secret societies and to Lord Rothschild. But the final will sets out the terms for Rhodes scholarships administered by the Rothschilds. You know, we've had a few prime ministers in Australia who've been Rhodes scholars. I believe that Bill Clinton was a Rhodes scholar. So yeah, a big indication that these people are Rothschild agents. Cecil Rhodes in 1891, William Steed and Lord Escher, Rothschild, Salisbury, Rosebury and Milner drew up a plan for a secret society, the round table that aims to bring all habitable portions of the world under their influence and control. So Cecil Rhodes' round table led to the founding in 1921 of both the US-based Council of Foreign Relations, Chatham House in London, Bilderberg founded in 1954, the Club of Rome, the Trilateral Commission, all of these organisations are dedicated to global governance and there is extensive overlap in terms of the principal players, the same forces created the United Nations. So if Cecil Rhodes and if Balfour and all these particular people were involved with this round table establishment and globalism, being a child of the 80s, I remember a lot of uh, information or scare tactics coming out about the greenhouse effect. And so um, here we've got from NASA themselves, what is the greenhouse effect? The greenhouse effect is the process through which heat is trapped near Earth's surface by substances known as greenhouse gases. Imagine these gases as a cosy blanket enveloping our planet, helping to maintain a warmer temperature than it would have otherwise. Greenhouse gases consist of carbon dioxide, methane, ozone, nitrous oxide, chlorofluorocarbons and water vapour. Water vapour which reacts to temperature changes is referred to as a feedback because it amplifies the effect of forces that initially caused the warming. And you know, <laughs> all right, so we have this brother-in-law of one of these round table initiates researching and studying the nature of gases in our atmosphere. And here we have coming in the 80s, the greenhouse effect. You know, this Armageddon scenario of uh, warming the atmosphere through all of these gases which come naturally to our environment and would settle themselves naturally within our atmosphere based on their um, their weight basically and it, this is something we know if you've just been to a kids party with helium balloons that the balloon will only go as high as its weight will allow it to go so you know helium being lighter than oxygen it will rise to a level that and, until it, it is no longer lighter than oxygen it says here Scientists have determined that carbon dioxide plays a crucial role in maintaining the stability of Earth's atmosphere. If carbon dioxide were removed, the terrestrial greenhouse effect would collapse and Earth's surface temperature would drop significantly by approximately 33 degrees Celsius. You know, like, so we can see the big holes in this story already. It says greenhouse gases are part of the Earth's atmosphere. This is why Earth is often called Goldilocks planet. Its conditions are just right, not too far, not too hot or not too cold, allowing life to thrive. Um, so they want to put us in this position of like um, one slight variation of the system and we're all dead. And, you know, we go back to Genesis again and we've got God controlling the creation of the earth, uh, taking the elements out of the water, creating the earth, creating the atmosphere, the firmament out of the water. And so we live in a, a, an enclosed system that God's created that basically the gases will create their own equilibrium. We don't need to worry about cows farting or, you know, creating too much carbon dioxide. What we really need to worry about is destroying God's creation by cutting it down and taking out the resources, minerals, to make these big fat cats wealthy or more wealthy. As, you know, we look at the De Beers mining in Africa, you know, destroying their environment for greed, for diamonds, for gold. And we have, 
the earth under this spider's web and laurel wreath of, of these uh, aristocratic families. And I know the flat earthers love to point out that the earth here is a flat, round map and not a globe. Like I said, I cannot tell that myself. I, I can't prove that. But we've got some evidence here that this is what was believed by this ancient philosopher. Okay, so first of all, I found this article, The Truth Seeker, about the Cecil family, Satanist Jews, subversion of England dates to the 1500s. It says here, we usually associate the Illuminati with the Rothschild banking cartel, but according to Bradley Harding, behind them is the Saturnalian Brotherhood, the core 13 Jewish Jesuit Satanic bloodlines. By Bradley Harding, you may not be aware of the Cecil dynasty. It reveals the direct Jewish lineage of what is otherwise widely understood to be true blue blood noble titled land, ancient aristocratic British family. From the Real History etc. page 107, the founder of the family, William Cecil, first Marquis of Exeter, 1520 to 1598, was Chancellor of the Exchequer for Queen Elizabeth I and played a major role in both appearing to uphold the British monarchy through difficult times and guiding the laying of foundations for what became the British Empire. Robert Cecil of the Jewish Cecil family that had controlled the British monarchy since a Cecil became the private secretary and lover of Queen Elizabeth I, Dr. John Coleman, Conspirators Hierarchy, page 201. These families constitute a financer oligarchy. They are the power behind the Windsor throne. They view themselves as the heirs to the Venetian oligarchy, which infiltrated and subverted England from the period of 1509 uh, to 1715. I have a video on Venice and um, the origins of the Venetian mask festival which I believe ties back to Purim and the Feast of Esther or Ashtar. My research shows subversion began hundreds of years earlier uh, and established a new more virulent Anglo-Dutch Swiss strain of the oligarch system of Imperial Babylon, Persia, Rome and Byz Byzantium. Now, um, yeah, so if Cecil Rhodes is a uh, descendant of this Cecil family, I mean, I know Cecil is a male name, but it's kind of funny that he uh, he gave his fortune away to the Rothschild bankers, and uh, you know, it talks about his dreams of of an Anglo-Saxon rule of of the world through the British Empire, but none of the uh, events that came out of, of these people's plans for the British Empire had anything to do with Anglo-Saxon people. In fact, it was a detriment to the Anglo-Saxon people and only promoted these fake Jews. So I also found some um, this article on upper atmosphere experiments. Um, it's um, barium cloud experiments in the upper atmosphere. And here, you know, they're admitting here that space it says space techniques using sounding rockets, satellites and space probes made it possible to send instruments into space not only to measure the physical parameters of the surrounding atmosphere but also to carry out experiments in order to learn about matter and fields in, spa and fields in space. When injecting barium clouds into space, both measurement and experimentation occurs. The barium can be used to trace the movement of atmospheric plasma and thus to measure the electric fields. This is only valid if the artificial plasma cloud does not disturb the surrounding atmosphere too much. By injecting a stronger cloud, it is possible to study the active interaction with the surrounding magnetic field. In this way, one might study interesting general phenomena of plasma. Experimentation occurs if the pressure of the artificial plasma is much stronger than the pressure of the magnetic field in space. So, you know, we've got. Um, the chemtrails where they're releasing barium and strontium into the upper atmosphere, you know, are they trying to play with our magnetic field by doing this? Experiments with artificial plasma clouds have provided new possibilities for studying the plasma under conditions that cannot be easily set up or may even be 
impossible to realize in a laboratory. These experiments are comparable to methods of observing the velocity of a homogeneous fluid. Okay, so, you know, like, the admitting here that our upper, upper atmosphere is plasma gases, or let's look at the um, definition of plasma here on Wikipedia. Plasma from ancient Greek, moldable substance, is one of four fundamental states of matter. The other three being solid, liquid, and gas, characterized by the presence of a significant portion of charged particles in any combination of ions or electrons. It is the most abundant form of ordinary matter in the universe, mostly in stars, including the sun, but also dominating the rare field intracluster medium and intergalactic medium. Plasma can be artificially generated, for example, by heating a neutral gas or subjecting it to a strong electromagnetic field. The presence of charged particles makes plasma electrically conductive with dynamics of individual particles and macroscopic plasma motion governed by collective electromagnetic fields and very sensitive to externally applied fields. The response of plasma to electromagnetic fields is used in many modern devices and technologies such as plasma television or plasma etching. Depending on temperature, the density of certain number of neutral particles may also be present, in which case plasma is called partially ionized neon signs and lighting are examples of partially ionized plasma. So, you know, like if we've got electromagnetic currents running through what we know as space, uh, uh, through a, a, a superfluid and points becoming um, at some point where potentially like the the star in a jar where this the bubble becomes intensely hot uh, through vibration and lights up you know what's to say that our moon or our sun as we know the sun is plasma nebula a plasma and at this point they light up because of the vibration that's running through this medium or this uh, liquefied gas. A typical method involves spreading some colored particles of metallic dust into a fluid. Normally one uses only a very small amounts in order not to disturb the behavior of the fluid. More than 90% of the cosmic objects are in a plasma state, but are also very dilute and therefore not visible except where concentrated in stars. The cosmic plasma consists mainly of ionized hydrogen and helium molecules, which have an extremely small cross-section for light scattering. And so, like the even smaller electrons, do not scatter enough light to make their presence visible. So, therefore, it would be interesting to inject into a cosmic plasma a suitable material that with, has a cross-section large enough for light scattering to make the motion of cosmic plasma visible. For a plasma with very high electrical conductivity, this is of particular interest. Since every motion perpendicular to the magnetic field lines or force can be described as the motion of the magnetic line force. H. Althen used the Im image of magnetic line of force frozen the plasma. One thing I really want to point out is that we live in a false system, a false kingdom. It's the beast kingdom. Everything about our reality and uh, how we see that reality is the kingdom of, of this earth and this material realm. And the Bible warns us about this in that Second Thessalonians, I'll read the scripture, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. And, and I, I'm just going to stop here. The day of Christ is at hand. You know, what's the day of Christ? And it's the kingdom. The kingdom is now. We live in the spiritual kingdom of Christ and of God the Father, yet we're still having to be part of, of this beast kingdom in the flesh. 
Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. I don't believe that's an actual man in the sense of it's it's just people or men, mankind is like Judas. He was with Jesus and uh, he betrayed Jesus and he returned back to this false kingdom and false temple worship and false false priests and, and when he was in the presence of the Son of God and his kingdom who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Now where is the temple of God? You know we're not talking about some earthly building or church. You know, it's the same as the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is in the forehead or the temple or in the hand. So it's in our thoughts, it's in our actions. And the temple of God is in our thoughts, it's in our mind and in our head, our thoughts. And uh, so this beast kingdom and this man of perdition sits in our thoughts and in our, our understanding. So he's, he's saying he's God in his kingdom. All the information its kingdom gives out as gospel and its doctrines and its beliefs and its stories that it tells us is the man of perdition sitting in the temple of God pretending to be God, giving his own story of creation and basically telling the great deception. And people believe it in their temple, in their forehead. They have the mark of the beast or they have God in their temple. The man of perdition is the father of lies. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. And only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So we know that Satan is simply an adversary. Even him whose coming is after the working of the adversary with all power and signs and lying wonders. So his lying narrative, his lying system, his uh, lying about everything because he's saying he is God and it's his creation and this is how it was made, why it was made and who it was made for. And with the deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion. So God sends them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. So God sends them the delusion. And why does God allow them to be deluded? Because they are wicked or self-righteous. And God allows them to believe the delusions of the beast system and the fairy tales of the beast system. So we are to stand firm, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to, to salvation through, through sanctification of the spirit and the belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel, to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. So hold fast to the traditions that we've been taught in the truth of the scripture. So if it's not in scripture, if it's not according to the word of God, the Bible, then any theory or scientific explanation of God's creation that is contrary to the truth and to the traditions of the word 
then it's a strong delusion. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. So I just want to point out in Isaiah 40, verse 22, And he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in, that bringeth the princes to nothing. He maketh the judges of the earth as vanity. The Bible is telling us that the earth is a circle. All right, so let's look at the translation of circle because that will give us some clues. The translation of circle is the word chug or chug, circle, circuit or compass. A circle derived from the root chug which means to encircle or encompass. So the Greek equivalent used in the Septuagint for chug is gyros which also means circle or circuit. The Hebrew word chug primarily denotes a circle or a circuit. It is used to describe a circular nature of the earth or the heavens emphasizing the completeness and the perfection of God's creation. The term can also imply the idea of a boundary or limit, as seen in the usage in the context of the Earth's horizon or the heavens. So it says here in ancient Near Eastern cosmology, the concept of a circular Earth or heavens was common. The Hebrews, like their neighbours, understood the world in terms of a flat disk with a dome-like sky above. The use of chug in Hebrew Bible reflects this understanding while also highlighting the sovereignty and creative power of God who establishes the boundaries of the earth and the heavens. So the exhaustive is circle, circuit, compass. It's from the original word kug, circle, circuit, compass to describe a circle, primitive root. It says here the Hebrew word Kug primarily denotes the concept of a circle or circuit. It is used to describe the act of drawing a circle or the idea of encompassing something. In the biblical context, it often refers to the circular nature of the earth or the heavens, emphasizing God's sovereignty and the order of creation. So a primitive root Chagag to describe a circle compass. Chogag, Chogag to celebrate, to hold a feast, to make a pilgrimage, to move in a circle, to march in a sacred procession, to observe a festival, to be giddy. To make a pilgrimage, keep a pilgrim feast. Primitive root properly. To move in a circle. So, you know, does this mean that the earth is like a circus ring? You know, like that kind of concept of a, a, the word circus comes from that. Um, does it mean to encircle? Like if you start at one point and keep walking and you can come back around in a circle to the other side. I don't know for sure, but I kind of have a feeling that this particular symbol here is actually re representing a compass or a circle of travel. We have the arms of this symbol going left or right. It's a prosperity symbol and the ancient Sanskrit meaning of this word, it is well or well-being, good existence, good luck, or I've heard it said to go well. And it seems to be a positive symbol for travel, a good journey. There's so many cultures that use this symbol going back to the ancient world. It says here that um, in 1979, a Sanskrit scholar known as P.R. Saka claimed that the deeper meaning of the word is permanent victory. 
He also said that, like any symbol, it can have positive and negative meanings. I mean, maybe that's literally positive and negative or right for heading towards the east or left heading towards the west, meaning depending on how it is drawn. So in Hinduism, the right-hand swastika illustrated below is a symbol of the god Vishnu and the sun, while left-hand swastika is a symbol of Kali magic. So here we have a good picture of negative or positive versions of this symbol. And we have a compass here with the cross of the compass and potentially we have the needle pointing to the right or the east or to the left, the west. And we have this symbol with the arms pointing in motion to either the right or the left, depending on which cardinal direction you may want to travel. Just a thought or a theory I have on, on what this symbol actually means and why it was so important to ancient people and, you know, especially here the Phoenicians used this symbol a lot and uh, they were uh, big sea travellers but also like a lot of cultures travelled across the land and I've heard that it was is actually linked to the North Star as well. So, you know, we have positive or negative, north and south and east or west. So does that particular symbol point to um, the shape of the earth? And maybe that's why they've used the symbol for such a negative reason and maybe this that symbol has some kind of information for mankind that's, that's linked in there. Uh, I don't know about this, but what I do know is that we're living in the great deception and we are living in the kingdom of the beast and every narrative and every story of how we're here and why we're here is a deception and we really have to look into these theories and stories that we're given so in 2030 agenda for sustainable development adopted by the all united nations members states that in 2015 provides a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet now and into the future. It is at its heart there are 17 sustainable development goals. So in a global partnership they recognise that ending poverty and other deprivations must go hand in hand with strategies that improve health and education, reduce inequality and spur economic growth. I mean, how much more economic growth can we have? all while tackling climate change and working to preserve our oceans and forests. So this is just Tikkun Olam, it's the Zionist belief. Tikkun Olam is repairing the world, is a concept in Judaism which refers to various forms of actions intended to repair and improve the world. So Agenda 2030 is a Zionist Tikkun Olam. We have the little Rothschild agent, Greta Thunberg promoting the United Nations Tikkun Olam Agenda 2030. And Agenda 21 and 2030 New World Order is a plan to depopulate 95% of the world's population by 2030 and it's happening right now. Another name for Agenda 21 is Sustainable Development. Most people have never heard of this. Start researching Agenda 21 and 2030. Uh, this post goes into detail on Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030, the New World Order. How can they make everybody's life sustainable is if we depopulate, then there'll be enough for everybody to go around, enough slaves to keep them happy. So using these aristocratic families, science and information, again, we're fed a false narrative about how our world and our environment actually works. And they use this fairy tale script basically to manipulate us into being their slaves.
Thank you.